Hey guys, this is Chelsea with Hennapreneur, and today I am thrilled to introduce you to Connie Too of Created by Connie, based in the UK. Um, Connie is a very well-known henna artist in many different arenas, but I'm not gonna do all the things. I'm not gonna introduce her for you. I'd love for, Connie, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and and your your journey with henna? Um, I've been a henna artist for about five and a half years. Um, and I came upon it accidentally. I've got a really, I mean, I have a story that I tell everyone and how, how I came across it, but I actually think that it started like maybe even years before that. And it sort of, everything just happened really, really quickly. I think I, I started when the social media really took off for henna. And then as a result, my journey sort of went up really, really, really quickly, really like almost too quickly I, I feel like some some parts of me peaked a bit too soon <laughs> mm. and um I'm now at a point where I feel like I'm ready and it's time for me to just level out figure out where I'm going where, where I'm staying long term and who I am and what I'm doing and and what I'm what I'm here to stand for really so no so I don't know I don't know the story so can you tell me tell me the spiel that you give everyone and then tell me like the secret backstory of like when you actually started with Hannah. Okay, so my standard story is that um there was a year I think after having kids and um I've been wanting a tattoo and a friend of mine wanted a tattoo as well and so I said, okay, let's go together. There's a really cool tattooist near me who does happy tattoo tattoos and it's the bamboo style and so um we went for a consultation, we talked and she had a design ready and I had no design. I said I just want something floral that will represent my husband and my kids. And he drew something out. I was like, No, I don't like that. And then he was about to draw something else and he just stopped and he, he didn't even look up at me, he just said, I think, you know, if you have an idea then you can probably design it yourself. And I at the time I remember thinking, Well, you know, this is your job, you know, shouldn't you be able to design it for me? But um <laughs> When I walked away with my friend, I remember saying, I mean, like, shouldn't he be able to design for me what I want? And she says, well, I think you, she's my old school friend. So I have known her since I was 10 or 11. And she was, she turned and said, well, I think you're more than capable of designing it yourself. And oh, I think wow. if anybody else had said it, I would not have, even if my husband had said it, I don't think I would have listened. But because you know, I went through school with her and we used to do art classes next to each other and, you know, we did our exam exhibition together. There's, I can't lie to her. She knows. She's seen, you know, what I've done back when I was a kid. So when she said, I think you're more than capable, I realized, okay, maybe I just need to shut up and just try to do it. So I ended up designing my own tattoo after that consultation and it's now tattooed on me um, and it's brown. Um, because I never wanted a black ink tattoo. And this was way before I found henna. It's brown. So I've got this brown tattoo on my hip. And that was also the same year that she took me to an exhibition back in our hometown. And as we were walking around, one of the other um, visitors stopped me and asked me if I was one of the artists, one of the exhibiting artists, um, even though I don't even know where she got that from, but she just stopped <laughs> me and asked me. And I said, oh, no, not me. I don't have an artistic bone in my body and just sort of, ha ha, laughed it off and just, you know, huddled off. And then, um, the same friend I said to, did you hear, did you hear that woman? She just stopped me and did you hear what she asked me? And my friend, Kath, she called, she said, I heard her and I heard you outright lie to her. Oh and, my God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she, so it was, I think it was that, it was those things that year they just sort of all like domino effects they all sort of knocked on to each other and um and I went to a Chandra and I had some henna done and I was asking her all all the questions that people ask me now like when did you get started where do you get your designs from do you make your own henna and you know all this and so um I got the book I, I remember watching her thinking I can do this I can do this I can do this so I went out to a shop, bought one of those nasty chemical cones and um, just started drawing with them. Um, the smell was like more, but I remember just <laughs> feeling that the drawing was really therapeutic. It just came really naturally, even from the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and that was it. I was hooked and it was, you know, I went on 
social media posting about it on my private account and then found henna recipes and other henna artists and started mixing within a few months and it just it just snowballed and then it got out of hand and, and here I am so that, that's the standard version <laughs> but I think um, I think my long version actually starts with actually having kids so um, if I took the when I started when I got my tattoo it was like uh, what, 2012 2013 but I feel like it all started when I had kids because hmm. I I'm, I would say I thought I knew who I was mm-hmm. when I was younger and I thought I knew who I was when I got married and we lived abroad so you know those are fairly challenging conditions you know out of your comfort zone living in a country that's not you know that you're not totally um, natural with but then when we had kids I feel like I, I don't know about you and your experience of being a parent but I just completely lost myself I completely I don't I don't know where I went I don't know who I was I didn't know I didn't I just didn't know which of me was me which of me was supposed to be a mother I it, just, it was a really difficult adjustment period and looking back I realized it was probably postnatal depression but I was just adamant that I wasn't going to be medicated and that I it was manageable right. um, and it probably because my husband is just incredibly supportive and he's just he's been my rock and he you know they talk about depression being the black dog and living with a black dog I mean like this guy had to drag this black dog around and live with it in his house and you know yeah. and, and have two babies as well so um it took I think my son was five and my daughter was three before I actually started doing something productive towards it and I think I went into some therapy sessions um, I started doing I found a jiu-jitsu teacher and when I met her it wasn't that I wanted to do jiu-jitsu it was that I knew that I she would not take any, any shit basically she if she asked me to do something it would be because she would do it herself as well so mm. I knew that I knew she was the right teacher for me so it didn't matter what she taught I was going to go I was going to follow her and and then when I started learning jiu-jitsu with her piece by piece the confidence started rebuilding and then it was I think it was during the first year or so of jiu-jitsu the tattoo incident and the art gallery incident happened and then it just as the confidence grew I sort of found myself again I mean it helped that the training also was like a time away from the kids and with other women because I started off in the women's session mm-hmm. and found that you know just working with other women and realizing that when I went into the dojo to train these women were coming in from all walks of life there were women with full niqabs and just you know for me it was an eye-opener just like people who had from scarves to niqabs to like me coming in jeans you know that sort of thing realizing that we're all we're all the same yeah, you know, and um, and I feel like that was, I think that journey had to happen for me to get here. If that makes sense. No, that does. That makes a lot of yeah. sense to me. I think I think a lot of us parents, like we do, we 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 enter parenthood with an expectation that we should be a particular way. Like there's this really foggy but very judgy sort of air around parenthood. And so then once you get there, it's like, what part of me, what part, like you said, what part of me is me and what part of me is being clouded by this Mm -hmm. expectation perhaps. And Mm -hmm. no, I relate to that a lot. I think, you know, as henna for me has been so therapeutic and so um, reviving and re-energizing. Um, just as an individual, I feel like before mm-hmm. Hannah, um, I, you know, I was already a parent. I was a single mom when I started and, uh, that the experience of moving into having this art form that I could use for myself and just be, and, and to serve women and to be able to connect with other human beings that were adults and had, you know, larger thought processes than what's for snack next. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that, even in yeah. that was empowering. Yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that I just 
it's just it's all been so empowering that I can actually make a business out of it I have a studio now what the hell I have a letterhead I have a you know email signature I have accounts I have you know it's it and I've done this all myself through henna as a result of henna it's um yeah I just feel like it's even the parts before henna are part of the henna journey I think so no I I totally agree with you so tell me like in terms of your personal growth because I, I really love that you one you use the word empowerment and that is like the core focus of everything that I do with henna is it comes down to empowerment. So I love that, like we're speaking the same language, but you also, you know, you mentioned that, that those things that you've been able to achieve and like how all of this came from this, this art. Right. So in terms of like personal growth, like in what ways has Connie changed through that experience with henna? Oh, for better, for worse, or yeah, I definitely think it's, I've, there's been a lot of progress, a lot of personal progress. But it's, I think it's hard to describe because it's happened in such tiny increments that I have barely noticed it. Um, but I think one of the biggest landmarks was, um, I think a year and a half ago, nearly two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I um, decided to go on medication for um, depression and anxiety mm-hmm. and my kids are, were 10 and 8, about yeah, 10 and 8 at the time and I think that was when I sort of realised how much I'd grown personally because I think I've been living, if you think I've been living for nearly 10 years with this mental health issue mm-hmm. and just ignored it and just got on with everything. To finally get to a point where I felt strong enough to seek a professional and say what I'm going through isn't right. It's not good for me. It's not good for those around me. It's not good for what I do. And I'm ready to do something about it. Right. I think. I think. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things. And since then, it's been. It, I feel like the henna journey has been a catalyst. And where I am now, it's almost not its almost not about the henna anymore. It's almost about the henna's going along. And I'm actually still developing a, a part aside from the henna. Like the henna business is trundling along. I'm sort of leaving it to, to do what it does. But personally, there's still growth going on that's no longer linked to it. It, it was kick-started by it. But... but you know, I'm finding myself giving myself permission to take up space and, you know, permission to just be lazy if I need to be lazy and recharge. Um, I'm giving myself permission to explore other ideas and other mediums. I'm like, I'm giving myself permission to make crap or make nice stuff or, you know, I'm <laughs> slowly, I'm slowly embracing the fact that I'm an artist. You know, I I can't I, even saying it makes me a little bit like I'm not really an artist, but <laughs> if I just if I keep saying it, I'm an artist. I'm an artist. I have to listen to myself at some point, and you know, it all it all set, it all it all you know, it all load in, and it all say it all say what is there. <laughs> but it's, it's the case of yeah, it's this is all just I'm rambling, but it's it's all sort of ticking along in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. Because each year I run this business, I become more legitimate. The emails that I get become more like, we want you back again this year. Or, you know, we're looking for you. We want to hire you. And those sorts of inquiries and emails, they, you know, it's proof that I am what I have been telling everybody I am. I am a henna artist. I'm a professional artist. Yeah. The email say so, you know. <laughs> so it, it, it's it's like really reaffirming so each year I do it the stronger it gets and the more legitimate I I realize I am Mm -hmm. and when I legitimize myself I'm giving myself more permission and confidence to be me oh Um, I love that (laughs) I love that no I really do I really love that like the concept of of giving oneself permission 
it's so liberating, but it is terrifying. Yeah. And so like to hear just, just like, even within your own journey, how it, it goes from first speaking the affirmation, like, and just reaffirming yourself. No, I am an artist. I am a professional. I am an artist. Right. Yeah. And then to see how that comes to fruition through, you know, I, I, I feel like there is power in words. Mm. And so when you're thoughtful about the words that you use and when you're strategic about the words that you use and just mindful about them, then that's the reality that you create. So I love hearing what you're saying about about where this is taking you thus far. Now, I know you said that a lot of those those lessons that you've had or a lot of the change, I guess I could say that you've had over the course of your journey has been so small that perhaps you didn't notice it even. And I think that that really resonates a lot with me also in my experience. For you, has there ever been a point where you've turned around and been like, I don't even know that person anymore? Or um, has there ever been a place where you're like, I don't like, how did I even get here? Like, is that an experience that you've had also? And if so, tell me about it. Um, the first time, um, I was accepted to be an instructor at Hennecott. Um, I remember thinking, holy crap, they let me in. They're going to find out that I don't know what I'm doing. And (laughs) And then, and then, um, I got there and I was behind the registration table. I was helping people sign in and giving them a welcome pack. And one guy came up, he's called Wesley, and um, he came up to the registration table and he said, yes, you're Connie. I really, I can't wait to go to your Food of Life class. And I remember what I actually said to him was, oh, no, 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 there's no need. I've done a really helpful worksheet. It's all in the workbook. You don't need to come with me. <laughs> don't come. And then, and then I, don't come. It's fine. The worksheet's great. I did a really good worksheet. Just take the worksheet and just, just no need to come. It's fine. It's nothing to get excited about. And and that whole that whole year, it was 2015. That whole weekend, I had massive massive imposter syndrome I could not be present I could not enjoy it I couldn't allow myself to just um I didn't realize what I was doing it was it was the other instructors who sort of um comforted me and told me and they said that you just need to allow this love in and I remember like I don't know what they're talking about I'm fine and then it was only when I came home and I saw my husband. And, you know, you see your husband and you're used to allowing his love in. Right. And it's almost like oh, the moment I saw him and his love came in, every, everything else came in at the same time. And uh, we were in the car coming home. And I was completely overwhelmed and suddenly burst into tears. And he's just driving along thinking, oh, crap. <laughs> and he's like, so I take it, it was good then? And I'm like, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> It floods of tears because all the things that I'd been holding back, the wall that I had kept up to, to survive the weekend, just suddenly came crashing, crashing in at me. And that was a huge moment because I just thought, I, I can't believe I'm here. I mean, literally for three days, I couldn't believe I was there and, and I wasn't allowing myself to be there. Um, so that, they, that was um, huge because I couldn't, believe not only was I accepted as an instructor but that there were people who knew my work who respected my work and who came to my classes and wanted to hear what I had to say I had Kim Brennan sitting in the front row of my Seed of Life class and I remember just looking at Kim thinking there is nothing I can teach you that you cannot do already you're amazing why are you even here and I was completely (laughs) completely overwhelmed Oh, wow. And, 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 yeah, for about 10 minutes, I remember again, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was really it was a really overwhelming um, weekend. And I'm really grateful that they put me in that position, that they trusted me to, to take it and, you know, that they, they wanted me there. Yeah. And, yeah, it gave me a lot of legitimacy to what I intended to to do where I intended to go with this as a business and as a person. I love that. 
That's so cool. That's so cool. But yeah, imposter syndrome, it's, it is. It's so real. And it's funny how it just kind of creeps in. Yeah. Like it just creeps in and it affects the things that we do and the things that we don't do and the risks that we take and that we tell ourselves that we can't take, that we don't have permission to take. So I love I that. Like it's mostly it's, it's mostly women as well. It and is. We're in, a real, we're in an age where it's all about female empowerment, but it's also there's a huge generation of us because of the way the world and the economy is. We're all striking out. We're all becoming entrepreneurs. We're finding creative ways to make to make money, to make an income, to make a living. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of us are, you know, trying new things and breaking out of our comfort zones or, or you know, getting creative. And and we don't always have, you know, the um, official educated rubber stamp background that correlates with it. And we use that instantly because, you know, we, we a lot of us have been institutionalized through the education system. We just think that if you're going to be an artist, you should have a degree in fine arts or art history, you know, to legitimize that. Uh, and, and you should have had an exhibition. You should have one medium that you work with and you should have sold, you know, all of these things. Um, and it's, it's more the system. It's not actually who we are. You know, we can be an artist without having all of those things. It doesn't mm-hmm. come to be an artist. And it's sort of, it, we're in that age where we're just we're in that era where we're sort of trying to accept it without having to qualify it, you know, with qualific with paper qualifications like we used to. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I think we're in a really strange era. Um, I think there's a lot of adversity going on, which is leading to a lot of creativity, which is bringing out the imposter in all of us. I think so. Yeah, we're all just, you know, I, I see it in everyone in all walks of life. Everyone's like, well, you know, making excuses for why they're not good at what they're actually doing or why they're not doing what they should be doing. You know, everyone's got it. Um, and it, I'm not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> I think, it, I mean, it is. It's con- there. I, I too, I, I agree with you. And I feel like there. I also, I have a lot of conflicting opinions and conflicting thoughts about it. And all in all, I mean, the, the takeaway is that I'm, I'm thrilled to see people leaning into their creativity and finding creative solutions for, for their life experiences and, and finding ways to make, make those life experiences better. And at the same time, it, it's a little bit like we're living the Wild West in our industry mm-hmm. and we're living the Wild West, I think, in general as when it comes to entrepreneurship and what it is to own a small business and so forth. Um, mm-hmm. so no, I agree. So, you know, so tell me like, where is, tell me about your business today. Like what is your typical work day look like or work week look like? Um, my typical work week is, um, responding to email inquiries, sending out, um, either a quote or sending out an invoice or explaining how to book online because I don't know. I'm okay with booking online, but I I, I have to I, I have to work hard to understand that not everyone is okay <laughs> or comfortable with booking online. So sometimes I'm, you know, explaining in an email how to book online and trying to be as accommodating as possible and helpful as possible. Um, answering the occasional phone call, but I really I really hate answering the phone, um, which is real. <laughs> It's something I have to I have to work on in my business because you, 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 retrieving voicemails and calling back is just as bad as answering the phone call, right? So you might as well just answer the phone call and just deal with it. Oh um, my god! So, you know, I have to be like the conditions have to be right. My voice has to be awake. I don't want to sound like I've just woken up. I, I don't want to feel rushed. I don't want background noise. I don't want my kids making noise in the background. And before you know it, I've, I've missed the call again and it's gone to voicemail and so it's yeah it's, I'm just, I, I have a real hang up about phone calls but it's, I do answer them um <laughs> and then um mo- mostly now that the season's picking up it's preparing for weekend events so either I'm doing them festivals or um yeah festivals or art trails or events so it's about making sure I've got enough henna 
um, making sure my kit from last year isn't moldy, isn't smelly, it's clean, everything that needs washing has been washed, anything that needs updating is getting updated. Um, but yeah, that's my day and I'd say also um, what I'm trying to do this year is not sweat so much about all the admin and all the background stuff because I've done that two years in a row now. It's all set, everything is ready to go in my studio, I don't need to obsess about it, I can have time to just sit and draw or make something or you know, create something and just try to take my mind off it. Nice. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's mostly, um, yeah, social media as well um, throughout the week. I'd say I'm on, my social, I'm on my social media more now because the season's looking up, but over the last six months I've just ignored it, neglected it. And, oh, you were yeah. on a hiatus for a time. Yeah, and those things get addictive, you know? <laughs> they, no, they really do. I mean, they, they feel so good. You know? <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I'm free. You know, I, you're free from, it's almost, it's not other people's judgment. It's the judgment you start inflicting on yourself and seeing everybody else's highlight reel. It's just horrible. It's internal torture. And um, so, yeah, I went on the hiatus and I enjoyed it. So then I came back in just a little bit, a little bit. And, um, it's surprising how much drama can happen on such a tiny screen of words. Yeah, you know, it's it true. Why does it need to be so dramatic? Is it compensating for the lack of sensory input? I don't know. It, <laughs> it, I just feel like it's, it's so invasive now. I feel really invaded, you know, um, emotionally and psychologically. So I'm, I'm there, but if, if it's not doing me, me and the people who are interacting with it's not doing us any good i don't they not be there so mm-hmm. yeah i do i do go on but it's um i'm trying to reconnect with the people i'm there for um rather than reconnect with you know, the actual account and the actual business of, of social media now right so that just, social media takes up a lot of time I've neglected it a lot this year. I mean, I should be putting up events and things like that. I'm just... Because <sighs> I realise, like, in terms of my stats, a lot of my business doesn't come actually come from my social media. A lot of my business comes from either word of mouth or from my website because uh, um, people tend to Google the local area or henna artists, and my website does quite well in the local Google search, so... I figured if that's where the business is coming from, why am I sweating so much about social media? That is, so I love that you said this. So are you tracking like using Google Analytics or how are you tracking to see that, that people are coming through your website? Um, I, I have all the Google Analytics plugged into the website, but I pop in and I have no idea what the numbers mean, what the graphs mean. I look at it and go, it looks, I mean, I look at those analytic numbers and I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't look great anyway. All I know the only way I can track that is literally by the emails that come in. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not so much the, the number of emails, but it's not like I get a lot. I only get a few a month, I'd say. Um, but it's the range, it's the type of emails that I get. They are clearly people who've never heard of me, who've never seen my work. They've only found me through Google. So they've and then, or I've spoken to people who come to the studio who book online and I ask them how they find me and they say, oh, just Google. So mm. more often than not, the more interesting and the more, and the brand new, new, new clients I get have found me through Google. Um, it's not through any analytics that I've, I've got that. It's just literally from the people that I've spoken to and interacted with. So right. yeah, there's no, there's no stats or analysis going on here. It's, I'm just winging it every single day. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, you know what? It's, it's funny you say that because I feel like when we first start our businesses, like when we first start, we don't have that traction with Google. So you have to build your audience through social media because Google is not putting you on the front page and it's not putting you on like the first six pages, you know, you're like way in the back you're never going to be found. And so you do have to lean into social media, but then once you do have that more legitimate business, then you can say, okay, I can, I can afford to take a hiatus off of social media because my website is pushing the traffic to me that I need. You know, I've got that ranking. So that's amazing. Like even in that, there's so much um, validation 
for how amazing you are. Like, I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. Here's my here's where I'm gonna Im- use my imposter syndrome and explain how I got like first page ranking is because there's like a million henna artists in this city alone, um, but none of them have websites and um, none of them know what SEO is. I would say if I said mm-hmm. how's your SEO on your web- website, they'd be like what? And I don't know much about SEO but I know my meta tags and I know what to put in my meta tags in my website I had to build my website using WordPress so I've tagged every single page in there and my blog I make sure that the little description the meta description every time I update has all the corresponding things and those are the things that have pushed it up and it was just that basic knowledge of you know the spiders and Google how they work they pick up on keywords and so um I I would say I had very little online competition when it came to my website. So when it was up and it was ready to go, I was already leading, if that makes sense. All it needed was the people to start searching. And then once they started searching, because I was the only one there, mm-hmm. it got pushed right to the top. And at the, and in the beginning, because I was, I was living on social media because that's where my community was, that's where my support was, that pushed everything up higher, that helped it. Um, and so now, yeah, I can take a break, but I do know that I have to ping out a, a blog update, maybe minimum twice a year, just to keep it keep the fresh traffic coming. And even then, they're not local. You know, the people who come to read my blog are not local to me. They're usually international readers. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure how great it's doing, but you know, I I I have a basic knowledge that of how websites work and how to just keep them ticking over and how to keep them fresh yeah well no I agree with that I mean even one even if it's an international reader I think it's even better perhaps for Google because it's like no this is just great content let's keep putting it up there but I'm not gonna let you like fly by with that (laughs) mini imposter syndrome (laughs) impulse like yeah like what I heard so because I and I love to do this this is something that that my my coach does with me um also and so I'm I love that I get to put this hat on um, and be on the other side of the table. But like what I heard wasn't like, oh, I just didn't have enough. There weren't enough competitors there anyway. It didn't have to be that great. (laughs) Like, seriously, no. What I heard was kind of like you had one, you had the knowledge, right? You had the knowledge, you had the expertise to set up a thing. You built the website yourself. You put in the things like you, you, it takes time to learn those skills, and like you had the dedication and the the business acumen to know this is a thing that I need to do in order to keep myself up there and to keep myself relevant and keep myself accessible to people. Like, hello, that's a rock star moment. Like, that's not an imposter syndrome appropriate situation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so good for you. I love that. I love that so much. So like, what type of clients are you serving on a regular basis? Like those people that are coming to your website or come to see you in your studio? Like what type is that normally bridal um, on? What's that like? Definitely not bridal. Um, I don't. I get um, like my bridal inquiries are definitely the smaller, the smallest part of uh, my inquiries. A lot of them are. Um, I get corporations, uh, charities, and events contacting me to book me for providing henna to their public. Um, I get I get people asking about tattoos, um, belly hennas, and henna crowns. Um, that yeah, they're more alternative, more modern Western body art inquiries mm-hmm. than your traditional, you know, your Mendy, your bridal, your uh, speed, you know, those sorts of inquiries. Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm kind of grateful for because I have steered myself in that direction. I mean, I've done a fair amount of bridles and I can do bridles, but they are really, they're very backbreaking and very psychologically draining. And I just, I, just, I, I don't think I could do many of them. I could maybe do a couple a year and then that's it. I'm done. I can't, I can't do any more. Mm-hmm. You have to, you, you know, it's a lot of time to spend with someone. <laughs> you know, not yeah. just, not just 
doing their bridal tenor, but just spending the time with them with their energy is it's a long time and for them to spend with you. So, um, yeah, so I steer away from the bridal um, inquiries. But the bridal inquiries I do get, they do tend to be non-traditional. They do tend to be a more modern bride or alternative bride. Um, I'd say that my inquiries tend to be on the hippie yoga new age mom type of client than um than your usual young bride um looking you know looking for something for her big day wow i love that like we saw it sounds so it's so funny to me because it sounds so much i see so many parallels in our journeys and i'm like i'm geeking out over here you have no idea my my experience is the same like the majority of my clients are, are of that similar like that's that's what my days look like so like how because you said that you did steer your your way there also is it is it that is it that 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 energy exchange in those bridles because it is it's a lot is it just that like that's overload and it's like that's just not the type of thing that I want to do or did you know like was it a an intentional decision that I'd prefer to spend less time with a person service them get them out of the chair but have it like be short sweet and like just concise for both of us like what was it that made you choose to go an alternative direction um I didn't know for quite a long time I was pushing for bridles because everyone says you should do bridal henna it's good money and don't get me wrong it is really really good money but you know it's good money for a reason you know it's a lot of work I mean there are there are some amazing bridal henna artists who do two three brides sacked in one day and I don't I don't even you know they are worth their weight in gold they are worth the high price tag that comes with them because it's 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 physical and emotional and psychological and then um, I didn't I think I'd done them as many as I could for about two two and a half years and then I realized that I wasn't getting as much joy out of them as I could and like you I'm I'm in this industry for the human connection and I want it to be a good quality human connection I want to you know actually feel that we've connected and that we're almost you know we're friends by the time we finished and it's a hug when they go out the door and you know you feel like you've made a new friend or you feel like not only have you helped in some way towards their life but they've actually helped me grow as well in in the interaction right. and the more brides I did with that, the more, the less energy I had to give to each subsequent bride. And um, and the, the henna community, you know, I was in, I think I read a lot of the threads in the henna hub and I remember a lot of people, a lot of the henna artists that I look up to were starting to say things like, you, you don't have to do bridal, bridal's good money, but you don't have to do it. You know, it's just, if it's not your thing, it's not your thing. You don't have to push yourself into it. Mm-hmm. You can make something else your thing. And again, it, it was giving myself permission to not, to not do something and to do, and giving myself permission to do something else. And it's almost like I needed, once I, I saw that other people were giving permission mm-hmm. to do that, I realized that the only person who wasn't giving me permission was me. And I had to, I mean, even my husband at home was, he was saying it long before I read it in the community. You know, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Why do it if you don't want to do it? If you don't enjoy it, uh, and he will always remind me that no matter what I've read somewhere else in terms of support, he'll remind me that he has actually already said it in some way or other to me. I'm just, because he's my husband, I just didn't listen to him. Basically, um, yeah, yeah, it's standard, right? <laughs> Exactly. Um, the yeah, it, this is par for the course. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's in our vows, you know. They don't know it, but it's there. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, it was it was seeing that other people were giving permission, were allowing that, were saying it's okay to do that. Before. And then I realized, okay, I I don't enjoy it. It it might be good money, it might pay the bills, but it's just it it it, it would take me two days to recover. I think that was the I think that was the cutting point was realizing that I would need one day beforehand to prepare. And then I would need two days to recover. And I thought, 
if I was the sort of person who could do two brides in one day and not need a full day, two days to recover, then this is something I can do. But the fact that I need a three day buffer zone and half a day to do the bridal, I just thought it, that's telling me that it, it's not in my skill set. I can do two festival days, three festival days and take one day to recover. Mm-hmm. So it just, yeah, it, I real, I started looking at the, how much recovery I needed from each thing that I did and realized that the cost to me was how long it takes, it takes to recover. So that's, yeah, but it, it's exhausting. <laughs> it is. No, it really is. And that's so relatable. I think I'm, I'm the same. Like I have reached a place in my business where I have to really like that bride to accept the booking. Yeah. Really it's like her. The secret to bridal. Yeah. Yeah. And, you have to love your bride. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so funny because <laughs> now like my audience is like picked up on it. It's a very small group of people that will hire me for bridal work. I this is not something that I specialize in. It's just I'm I'm the same. I'm, I'm not thrilled about the time and the energy spent there. Um so I'll have people now who like <laughs> who will like sneak in and like when we're sitting together, that's when I'll learn that this is a bridal booking. And it's, they're like, I'll just take two 30 minute sessions. Is that okay? And I'm like, Hmm. Mm. <laughs> and, so, and so it's right. It's, right. Exactly. I'm like, okay. Oh gosh. <laughs> so like how, for you, how long did it take you to get to this place in your business? Cause like you have your studio and like you have a laundry list of accomplishments you know, which one, I don't like, not all of our listeners will know what those are. So like, give me like the top three to five things that you have done that you've achieved in your, in your career. And then tell me like, how long did it take you to get to where you are today in your journey? Um, top three things that I've done. So I, yeah, I have a studio. I've been there two years. Um, it's a unit in a community art club. Um, I have been an instructor twice at Hennecon, um, which some people may or may not know is, a, is like the biggest international Henna conference. And I've won, I've won an award for best regional Henna artist, um, which then got me into the local media, and which then got me into um, BBC segment. So that sort of snowball so cool it's kind of crazy to uh, look back and realize these accomplishments because like where I am today I'm very much like very blase about all of those things because now I'm just as a business um, I'm still a baby business I'm still this is still a only I'm only just going going into year three and mm. if you've ever run a business first three years are the hardest they all say if you can get past three years you're doing good so my focus this year is just survival is working on survival techniques it's no more it's no longer about marketing and getting my name out there and getting the training or getting the progression anymore it's Mm -hmm. about finding a safe stable point to work at consistently that requires minimal effort um so it can retain my physical and emotional energy so that i can survive the marathon that's ahead Mm -hmm. that's what this year is about so i it you know not to diminish the accomplishments that i have but i feel like those i'm working on a day-to-day basis just because i have that in my past doesn't mean that today is going to be easy and the days ahead are going to be easy the work I feel like the work really starts now Mm -hmm. I love that perspective I really do but I feel like you know in our industry there's like this sense of celebrity right surrounding certain artists and it's like you reach this point and you experience whatever particular accomplishment and there are so many different ways that this can be achieved right but I feel like there's a our industry then looks and says, oh, this person did that thing. They're amazing. It must be so easy for them now. And (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, oh, business just might, it just must be pouring in. They don't have, they just get to sit at home and get the emails and do the clients and whatever. And I, it's not true. 
Like that experience is not true. You have to, you have to put the time in you have to do the marketing and you have to set up systems and so forth. So like for you, you're, you said you're, you're in that place where you're reaching a point of survival and like preparing for the marathon ahead, which I love. Are you already leaning into like automations in your business and building those systems out so that you don't have to spend the time answering those emails anymore? Like, what does it look like for you in this, in this stage of growth? Um, well, the online booking system, I've gone in and um, I use Acuity, like a lot of people use Acuity, and I have all my appointments set up and they all have the automated response, uh, email responses. Um, I've got them all into little groups and all the little time frames, and I've set my availability and I have got into automation. So now if there's anything that's happening with the school, with the kids, with my husband, it, I put it straight into my cal- calendar. So it's locked at that time. It's no longer available for booking. Um, but I still do a lot of um, manual responding to emails because I feel that I'm still small enough and I still want that personal connection through the email. Since, since I'm so bad at phone calls, I try to overcompensate with emails. So, um, um, I don't, I should have email templates, but I do find that each inquiry that comes in is usually unique. Um, I maybe have one, the template that I do have is for bridal inquiries actually. And when they come in, they tend to be very similar. So I have a set template response for all bridal inquiries and it's most, mostly to filter out the bridal inquiries for the ones that are serious, for the ones who are not only you know, um, can have the budget for it, but also would be a right fit for me and for them. Um, because I have, I require that they come in for a vital consultation to discuss the design ideas, but also for me to sort of gauge them and for them to get to know me a little bit. Because I always say in the consultation, we're going to be spending anywhere between four to eight hours with each other. So we kind of need to know that we get on because otherwise it can be really difficult for you and for me it's not ideal right before your wedding um so yeah that's about as as automated as it gets i've got a very friendly voicemail message (laughs) that's really good and that's that's another thing that says if i if i don't get back to you you can email me (laughs) because i'm so bad on the phone um i think that's about that's about as, as automated as i get but um i do need to um I don't, you'll know with your own website there's always work that needs to be done on the website yeah. it's never never finished and I speak to people who say oh I need to build a website but it's not quite right yet and I'm always telling them it's never going to be right you just have to get it out there and mm-hmm. get it live the sooner you get it live the better because you will always be tweaking it there's always something that needs to be done um, so yeah I feel like there's there's more there's always more that I can do on the website to automate that. But I also feel like I'm already more automated than my client base is, is ready for. Mm. So I have to balance that. I do feel like I'm trying to push my client base into the online booking and into the email interaction when um, there is po- probably a percentage that does and will prefer the phone call. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I just feel That's like I really think for people who book online, it's, it's. I just feel like you know, lo- locally, in this area, booking online is something that's strange to them for ah. for, for a henna service, and and that's what I um I think that's what I'm working against at the moment is I'm trying to encourage it. So that's one of the things I'm doing now is when I'm at a festival or event or exhibit then I'll put up a, a discount code just for that day so that if they book online today for a studio appointment they get they get a discount with this code and it's specific to that event mm-hmm. um, and if I have if I have space then I'll take a laptop and they can book there if I don't have space then I just encourage it because yeah I find that I think that's the biggest issue at the moment That's awesome. That's an awesome strategy. I've never heard of that. I've never thought to do it. That is something that I feel like is going to be in my booth now. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially, you know, I don't know if you do exhibitions, like sometimes you have exhibitions where you don't do any henna, you're just there. They just want you there to do like maybe one demonstration. And then you're just really answering questions. So I thought, well, I'm going to try and monitor 
tied with somehow I got to get someone booking an appointment so set up a laptop and a discount code and a little arrow saying book online here today and and then um, I think that I've done that twice and only once it, it actually took effect and I did have to sort of hold her hand with the booking system which makes me realize that what I'm working with that's what I'm working against that's what's working against me mm-hmm. so I think yeah that's that's what I'm gonna have to push wow well I think you know when it comes to like educating our markets it's so interesting because sometimes you do you find that there are things for us as as business owners right as entrepreneurs where we're like we we're one person and we're the accountant and we're customer service and we're the artist and we're the, like, we're doing all of the things. And so we have to lean into automation at some point or else it's just not, we're not, it's not scalable. It's not, it's not manageable. We don't like, we literally don't have enough time in the day. And so it's interesting to see how those things that are necessary for us in order for our businesses to survive can sometimes be challenging for our clients and require us to put in that extra time to educate and so forth so I think that's really I like that you have it set up within your within your you know your your event set up and like do you have on your website is it like here do this thing do you have like a like a facts section or like a FAQs or something to like help walk people through that like how does that education what does that look Uh, like for you uh no not yet I I do have like a I have a highlight on my Instagram which walks people through it um but I just think if you're able to use highlights you're able to book online probably yeah I'm you thinking this must come through the Google side more than the Instagram yeah, side so, yeah so from the Google side, I don't have anything on my website that walks people through it um mainly because I can't I can't think of a way to do it that's going to be accessible um, unless I may I may see I might I might look on YouTube and see if Acuity have already done one <laughs> and if they've already done a video that walks people through it I might put their video because I think that's what would really help is like literally a YouTube video of somebody literally going through the booking process you um, could totally do a screen recording like have you ever used Loom? No. But okay. It's a Google Chrome extension and it's free. And you could like it will screen record it and you can have like your picture down on the corner. So they see you and it's your voice and you're just like walking them through and click here and click there. And if yeah. you have a discount code and like Yeah. Oh, you should totally Yeah, I think that's what's needed. I think we should all do that. Everybody. <laughs> I think we should all do that. Everyone do the things yeah. to make the bookings come easier. Oh my gosh. I love it. Yeah, I love yeah. it. So like, so <laughs> what is your, so let's, okay. So you have the studio. What is like, what does that look like for you? How many clients do you see there on a regular basis? Um, I would, I go there at least, if I don't have a client, I go there at least once a week um, just to, just potter around or make henna or you know just have space um I actually I actually it really overdue a clear out because it's I've accumulated so much stuff and only recently I've walked in and realized I don't need most of this stuff I don't need it I don't use it I've I've done a whole year and I haven't touched some (laughs) of this stuff so I need to clear it out um, and I think once I've cleared it out, I'll be back to spending more time in there because at the moment I go in and I feel a bit overwhelmed. Um, it needs to be, I've got lots of pictures on the walls and I feel like it's time to take all of those down and, you know, have a clear, a much clearer space. Um, but I'm in there. Um, I've got a couple of appointments. I've got an appointment this week and then a, a festival this weekend. So I'll be in there a couple of times in the next few days. Um, but yeah, it's it's fairly cheap rent as well because it's a subsidised um, social enterprise. Huh. Um, the building itself is owned by a, a it's owned by a theatre and event company, so they own like the whole building and they use the top floor and they use the basement for storage. And then in the middle levels, there were these rooms. And so 
um, they set up a separate social enterprise called Dotfield Creative Arts Hub, and then they rented out all these rooms um, at a subsidised rate to, well, not subsidised, I think it's just at cost to us. Mm. And I've been there two years, and I believe the rates have not changed since before I joined them, which means that each year it's, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, and it's 24 hour access. Um, I have a lock on my door, then there's a lock to the communal area, then there's the driveway and there's a big metal gate, which is also padlocked that we, we can use. So I have parking. It's, um, I love it. I love it. Although it does need clearing out. Um, I loved it. And then I cluttered it. And now I need to declutter it. <laughs> and then I'll love it even more. But I do love having a space to drive studio appointment to do you know, especially Henna Crown, to be able to offer a private space mm -hmm. um, that's my own. I, I used to do coffee house appointments, um, which were nice in a way that they, they sort of, they provided marketing as well, because while you're doing it, other people are passing by and they're seeing it. But I always felt a little bit apologetic for being there, for taking space, for generating the henna smell and, you know, so to have some place that is my own, that I can, I have everything within arm's reach and it's my comfort zone. I can really be myself and I feel I can be more creative. So I, yeah, I really love working there. I really love working there. I think I feel like I don't love it as much at the moment because it needs to be cluttering. <laughs> I was going to do the call there. And then I realised that the Wi-Fi can be quite spotty in there and the lighting is all artificial because there's no window. And I thought, well, I can't do it there because if the Wi-Fi disconnects, I've got no backup. Whereas here, I've got backup because my unit's quite central inside the building. So mm -hmm. if I rely on the company Wi-Fi and it goes spotty, then my mobile data isn't strong either. But here, it's fine. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I do, I do love it. <laughs> How do, large I, is the space? But I didn't go for about a minute. It's like three meters by three meters, so I guess like a ten foot square tent size. That's a good size. So um, it's not big. Yeah, it's a good size, and it's nice and square. It's not, you know, there's no like funny corners or anything. Um, but there are other units in the in the hub that I do sort of look at and think, if anyone moves out, I would like to move over to the yeah. area because it's either big or it's just got like a tiny shaft of natural light coming in. But it is, it's plenty for what I need. And I did know when I moved it that if I ever filled it up and there was too much stuff, it was my fault for having too much stuff, not because the space is too small. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I'm, why I'm at where I'm at. It's just, I've just put too much thing, too many things. Oh gosh. So like, well, what sort of investment, because I know you said the investment, the rent is quite low for the space. What sort of investment was that for you or continues to be for the, for you? Um, originally when I got it, I signed up for one year and I asked my mum for investment towards it because, um, I probably, that first year I probably couldn't have been able to afford it off my henna income. Um, it's £105 a month. Oh my gosh. Which, I guess, that is so yeah, cheap. <laughs> that is so I know. Cool. That's like a no brainer. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. But even still, that first year, as any henna artist knows in their first, you know, first couple of years, you're literally just making money to pay for the henna, to pay for the car. To, you know, really, that's what. So I knew that I, I could pay it occasional months, but not necessarily every month. So I asked my mum to invest in that first year for me and um also in and also in the teaching qualification at the same time so gave me like a set amount of money and it went towards the studio and although I've not been able to repay the loan I am paying the rent on my own now so that's you know that's a start <laughs> but I think um it was my fault for tra I travel I've traveled a lot in the last in the first few years of my henna business and I've been to America a lot I've been to Hungary twice and I just feel like that's what's been eating my money up it's, it's, um, they were investments but you know it's time to cool it and see you know what I could actually make if I wasn't traveling so much but yeah that's 
105 a month, and that's included. That's everything included. That's the Wi-Fi, the electricity, oh, the heat, so the water. We have a communal kitchen, um, which just has a sink and a microwave, really, um, and a kettle. And then we have um, the three oil painters down the hall from me. Um, I have a street performer actor in the room behind me. Then opposite me, there's a photographer. And then um, we have a soap maker. She hand makes all her soap in, in one of the other rooms. It's, it's a really nice space to walk into. It's almost like you walk into it. It really helps legitimize me, for me. I sort of, when I, when I got it, every time I walk in, I'm like, this is an artist space. This is where other artists work. I'm walking in here because I have a room because I'm an artist. And, you know, it just it really, really helps. I love that. So, like, in terms of investment, because I think that sometimes we look at investment into our business and we, and we think about it like, where can we get that immediate return? And sometimes that return is financial, but sometimes that return looks a lot like that legitimacy and just the, the feelings that we have surrounding ourselves and what we're capable of and what our business is capable of. For you, what has been the best investment that you've made to date in your business? I'd say the studio. I would still, I would say the studio because I've noticed as well is um, when I'm out working festivals or if I'm out doing an, a home appointment, I do have people will either ask or I will bring up that I have a studio. And then um, I've had some clients, brand new clients come through and saying that, oh, I just figured you were more legitimate because you have a studio, you have a shop, you have a space. And yeah, it, it shouldn't, we shouldn't need that, um, but it does. It does carry weight, and it's such an affordable. You know, it's something. It's such an affordable rate, like you say, that it just it legitimises things for me, and it legitimises things on the outside looking in, seeing that I have an address, you know, and I have a physical location. I'm on Google Maps. If you want to know how to get to me, you just put my name into Google Maps, and it will give you directions right to the door. Little things like that. Yeah, I think they, it was the best investment. I mean, like I've done a lot, I've invested a lot in lots of training and lots of conferences, and they were all worth it. But if I had to pick one and not have done any of the others, I would say the studio. Wow. What about on the flip side? Has there been an investment? Like, what's been of all the investments that you've made? What has been one investment that you're like, it didn't give me the return that I'd hoped for? Um. I do a lot of um, I'm a uh, I'm a chronic shopper I have a real like <laughs> I'm an enabler like my friends don't go shopping with me anymore because I'm like oh this is great with this and you really see that and before you know it everyone spent all of their money so um, like I, I'd say oh uh, I'd say um I do a lot of mini investments. I buy a lot of little things that I class as business <laughs> business expenses. <laughs> and the receipt, it counts. <laughs> and that's, yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, I've logged it, so therefore it counts. Yeah. So I do a lot of that, and I feel like that has been the biggest waste of time and money. Completely. That is why my studio is cluttered. That's why I have too much stuff because I bought too many little, cheap, affordable things that I thought would help my business. And actually they've just become clutter and mess in my business and my life. There's so, like, there's, there's, there's so, so many little things, so many little things that I can't, you know, like the odd folding chair or the odd sign or the extra chalkboard that I really didn't need or, the chalk that I don't use because I use chalk pens or things like that, you know, <laughs> or, or things that I cling on to, like packaging for things that I would send out, but I have no intention of being someone who ships products out because I'm terrible at posting. So, you know, little things like that, I, I they are the biggest waste of time for me and for the business. I feel like they take my energy away from more productive things. Um, I think one thing that I kind of um, think 
kind of think I didn't need to invest in was I got a full I got a full set of colours. But you know the Hannah Glam the body paint stuff that is like a henna substitute and it's it's body paint. I got the full set, the full spectrum of colours. Mm-hmm. With the full intention of using them and I realised that I'm they're great fun and they're great as an alternative, but as a business and as a service provider, I don't think it's going to go on the menu at all. And it was a lot of money to buy. Yeah. But Those are products that, I mean, they're kind of like, <laughs> yeah, no, like in comparison, especially to henna, it's like the costs for those are so high. And then your lines aren't as clean, yeah. like... I'm the same. I, I've I've purchased uh, a bunch. They don't. It's not this. It's just not the same. And you know. Great. And they're great for a time. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like I think like a pop up day or like this is what I'm doing today. Like that would be a thing. But on a a regular yeah. service menu for me too, I have it's not, not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, the same. No, so I'm- I've not got any return on the investment that I put into that. So that's something that's definitely business wise is not worth my time. Um, good fun on a personal basis, but not, yeah, I've not made any money off the colored products to pay for the colored products. The henna paid for the colored products. So yeah, that, that seemed like something that I, I maybe should have thought a little longer about I feel like if I could advise anyone on on the color body art is that make sure you have had enough people ask for it before you go into it you know like actual paying clients asking for it not people asking if you do it people paying for it you know the people who are addicted to the glitter the people who are who come who already have face paint on and then get their henna and then get the glitter those are the people that you want to have regularly before you go into the colored body art and I, I did not have those people and yet I still bought all the colors so, yeah, <laughs> that you know, at the expense. oh my gosh it's true I think well it's it's it's, it's important though like for us because we you want to stay relevant and you want to make sure that you're like you're on the curve and you've got all the things be trendy mm-hmm. and like when you see something trending it is it's a risk it's a risk to jump in and say yeah I'm gonna try that I'm gonna buy it I'm gonna do it and you may or you may not even like it, like, but it's a risk that you have to take. And I think, yeah, um, I mean, like the real palette, the real giveaway for me was that I've not even done a photo shoot with it. And I love doing photo shoots with my photographer. And I've done a henna one and I've done a jaguar one. And I've had this colored, colored art for longer than I've had the jaguar. And I still haven't put it into a photo shoot. It just seems like if you, if that's the case, it's clearly not a good fit. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Oh, but I love that. Like uh, having clarity on the things that you, that you do, that you, that you enjoy, that you want to offer, that your people enjoy and they want to pay for, like, that's so important. And I, mm. I think knowing, knowing what your people want, I mean, that's, I feel like that's, that's when you're really in tune with with your business and that's where you see the most success so you're not just throwing stuff mm-hmm. at the wall and hoping that it sticks yeah. it's like no I'm I'm here and I'm listening to what you want and I'm, I'm going to deliver that thing for you yeah. so for you like what is a what is a standard session with you cost do you do you charge based on time or design size like what's that look like in your business uh, I charge based on time so my uh, studio appointment starts on 15 minutes uh, 15 minutes half an hour uh, I think I have a 45 minute one, one hour, and they go up in half hour increments after that. Um, but my home appointments, uh, they start from one hour a minute. So That's what I won't go to any house work. I see. Yeah, you're like, that's, yeah. <laughs> what is the dollar amount there? Or I guess, uh, yeah. what's the dollar amount on that? What, what's the cost to your, to your clients for those services? Uh, so I, my prices just went up this year. Um, Good for you. Which was hard. I know, not as hard as I thought it would be. I thought it was going to be a lot harder, but I think um, I had it in my head for so long that by the time I did it, I was like, oh God, what's taken me so long? Um, it's gone up to £20 for a 15 minute appointment, and it's gone up to uh, the equivalent, equivalent of £1 per minute, basically, mm-hmm. so £60 an hour, mm-hmm. which is nice and easy for me to remember. 
Um, so they start um, at home, they start from £50, and that's excluding travel charge. And that is very clear on the booking system as well that there is a, a travel charge that will be added on top. Oh, okay. So you, tra you you add on travel. Did you have any other fees in your business or is travel just the only one that exists? Uh, travel is the only one because I've never, I don't, I don't often need accommodation, but um, accommodation is arranged on top uh, separately mm -hmm. if it comes up, which could maybe once or twice a year. Not in, enough, it's not enough time for me to sort of automate it. Mm. What about um, for like for other services? So like you said, you have Jaguar also. Do you have uh, a surcharge for Jaguar? Do you charge everything the same just depending on time? Jaguar is a stu studio appointments only. Ah, that's and, interesting. Um, yeah, I won't take it out. I won't use it at festivals and I won't use it in the home um, because I, in well, I could use it in the home if it was an hour up, I guess, but they, every single person who wants to have Jaguar um, is must have a compulsory consultation because I've seen Jaguar take off and it's been a really rocky start and because of the rate of reactions that I've seen I have a compulsory consultation where it's a 15 minute 20 pound appointment which is redeemable against the subsequent booking um, where we go over their um, history of any skin allergies or reactions and they have a design there which is to test as well if they have any reactions so in a mm. way you're getting like a free design in addition to the appointment that you'll, you'll book right. but it's I've not, because people don't like booking online and because it's a compulsory consultation it's a real barrier to getting customers I've not had anybody I've actually not had anybody booking any Jaguar appointments because I've made it I'm, ma I'm making people work for it because I want them to understand how different it is from henna and how the chances of them reacting to it are higher than henna. So okay. It's not as high as people think because I've learned over time that it's down to the production method. And now that I'm, I really respect and work really well with the supply that I have now, I know, I feel it's not, you know, reactions are not much of a problem anymore. But mm -hmm. I don't know that, you know, that they're still not going to react to it because it's still a fruit, you know? So right. I want to really drive that safety message home in the consultation. Um, that's my point. I don't want to just offer Jaguar irresponsibly and just throw it away like it's, like it's henna. I want them there to be a real distinction in the two services. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why it's video only. And until I feel working outside, that my clients have a clear distinction between the two. I don't think I'll ever offer the two side by side in, in a festival environment. Mm -hmm. You know, I I I think that a lot of us, especially those of us who are who are seasoned in the industry, have a lot of mixed thoughts about Jaguar. And I really like that you have that higher barrier to entry for people to book the service with you. And I have something similar in my own business as well. I think that the, it's the education piece. It, until I mean, we've spent so much time educating on natural henna and now there's this other product which is also natural but it stains black and then there's the question of like but where did you get it from and and all of those things and and so I I hear you it's it's a challenge I think to to find that that balance in between how to offer the service but then also how to effectively um take advantage of the position that we have as professionals, as educators for our community. Um, mm. So yeah. I hear you. I hear you there a lot. Yeah. So let me yeah. ask you this. For you, what has been the biggest lesson that you've learned over the course of your head of journey, personally, professionally, otherwise, what's been the biggest takeaway for you? Um, for me, Personally, um, I have notes here. I wrote notes and I'm looking at them going, I really, what was I trying to say there? <laughs> but I, I think, I think personally, God, there's so much. <laughs> there's so much. Because <laughs> um, the henna community, I don't know if everybody has been through this, but I found when I joined, when I found, well, when henna found me, and then I found this 
huge henna community. It just felt like the most welcoming sisterhood mm-hmm. in the world. It felt like I'd found my tribe. Um, and I think that was like a year or two. It was beautiful. And I was warned, you know, that it's not idyllic. It's not a utopia. It's not perfect. Mm-hmm. It's like any family. It has, you know, relatives that people don't talk about and history and, and all sorts of things going on. And I think um, even though I was warned, when the honeymoon period stopped, when it ended, it still came as a bit of a shock because probably because I was so emotionally invested into the community mm-hmm. and um, I think for me this henna might be my business but it very much started as an emotional journey it just became a business um, I just started applying business aspects to it but it was all along something very emotional. It was about finding a place of belonging and finding people who accepted me for me and accepting myself for me. Um, but what I've learned is that you may have this emotional connection to henna in common with the next henna artist, but it doesn't mean you are one and the same personality or that you have the same nature, or that you have the same outlook on the world and life. And it it was a bit, it was naive and idealistic of me to even think that that would be the case. And I think, I mean, I can be, I do, I can be quite idealistic. I can, I see the best in people as much as I can. And that's not a fault. It's just it's not always realistic, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not always yeah. fair either on, on the people that you're projecting that onto. And I think that's what I've learned is that it, it's okay for me to see the best in people, but it's also okay for me to see, acknowledge the worst side of them and to not feel obliged to either point it out or try to help them do something about it. Mm-hmm. So I feel like what I've learned from my henna journey isn't actually business related at all, but definitely personally related because I've made mistakes, I've made enemies, I've made, you know, I've upset people, I've had people block me, and I have all these, you know, I have people who support me and, and think I'm wonderful. They're like, how could anybody block you? How could anybody hate you? You're just the nicest person. And I'm like, I'm really, I'm not the nicest person. I, I'm, I come across very nicely and I know that helps in my business as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not to say I'm a really nice person or I'm a really sweet person. I do, I'm also, um, I'm also Cantonese born, my parents are Cantonese and I was raised in Yorkshire. So, that's two really straight talking communities combined together in, in, in me as a person. And so I tend to call things as they are. You know, if I see it and I think it's wrong, if there's a way for me to say it, I'm going to say it. Mm-hmm. And um, not everybody likes that. But also sometimes just because I call it and say it, it doesn't mean that just because I have a point, it doesn't mean that it's right. Mm. so like I've, I've called I've called some people out on what they're doing and looking back I'm like it was really none of my business who was I to say that what they're doing wasn't right for them just because it seemed to me that it wasn't fair on the community as a whole and just because I felt it wasn't community minded mm-hmm. it still wasn't my place to to say something I mean we all have these little judgments in our head and it's okay to have thoughts like that it doesn't make you a bad person for for you to think oh my god I can't believe she's doing that you just let the thought pass through go out the other side but what I was doing was taking it to another level and saying have you thought that maybe what you're doing isn't you know can be seen as not great and no there's no need for that sometimes (laughs) you know there's no need for me to to say that there's no need need for me it's okay for me to have the thought but if they're not concerned about it is 
is it really something that needs fixing? Does mm. it really affect my my everyday life? Does it really affect my ethic and the way I live? Right. If it doesn't, then should I really be investing my emotional energy to try and write something that is someone else someone else is right? It might be wrong to me. I think those have been really tough lessons to learn um, because there's a lot of you know, people might think that I do this and I just throw it out there and I just pass judgment. But what happens is I end up going into like weeks and weeks of self exploration, wondering what I could have done differently and what I could have learned from that and what I shouldn't have done and what how, how I should have dealt with it better. You know. Mm. So yeah, there's it's been a tough emotional journey, and I think that's half the reason I'm almost secluding myself this year to sort of focus on me because I feel like I invested a lot into the community for it a good few years and now I'm sort of realizing that I need to nurture myself and be a bit stronger in myself before getting back in again. Hmm. It sounds to me like the takeaway then for you, the the largest lesson for you has been like acknowledging the humanity of others. Hmm. Um I mean I I always thought I was quite compassionate and Yeah. Uh, I mean it and more of like yeah, I, I don't mean like, in, in terms of c- compassion so much as the humanity and others in that they're, they, other people have the, they cut their, their actions, their behaviors, the things that they say, whatever, they're all colored by their experience. And who, like you said, who are we, who are we to, to address it if it, if it isn't harming someone, if it isn't you know, I, I feel like that, that journey, that realization is not an easy one. I feel like that's mm. heavy because it makes you, you do, you have to come into question within yourself of, you know, where do I stand and where are my boundaries and where, what does a limit look like to me? I don't know. You can tell me if I'm wrong, but like, that's what, that's what I'm hearing. And, and if that's, if what I'm hearing is correct, then I definitely identify with what you're saying. Mm. Yeah. It, 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 I feel like I'm still learning, you know. I th- I've learned, you know, that you can, I don't think it's just henna related. I think it's just the way the world has been changing in, in recent years. But I've learned that you can love someone and respect them and they can vote completely differently from you. Oh, I feel like yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah. And that is the foundation of what I've learned really that you can work with people and you can respect them and still not agree with them or you can you can discover something about someone that you love and you can not hold it against them um you know just like they won't hold it against you and I've also learned that what pe- what what people say about liberal people they say that the liberal liberal minded people are actually more closed minded and right-wing people and I used to feel that was really obnoxious and untrue but then I realized that actually yeah I have been known to be very judgmental in my liberalism of anyone who wasn't liberal and that is more closed-minded because they've never passed that judgment on me as you know as a socially minded person so oh wow yeah actually I I am actually acting more closed-minded than them um, they've just accepted me as me, and yet here I am passing judgment on them. So yeah, that it's it's been a lot. Yeah, I think it's it's closely tied to my Hannah journey and the and you know political affairs and, and world affairs as well. Everything just sort of um, is quite connected. Um, but yeah, it's been a really tough, really tough lesson. Just sort of realizing that you can respect someone's work and yet find them totally disagreeable. Hmm. <laughs> relatable that's relatable yeah. well, I, I, think, I think you know I there you come to a place I think in in our professional journeys and our personal journey like there's always you everyone has this experience where there's someone who perhaps you you looked up to at one point or perhaps you had a great deal of regard for and so forth and then once you gain proximity then you learn you know you start to pull those curtains back and it's like oh that's not yeah, how I, I mean, imagined that's, it. That's, no, yeah. And then and there's always the fact that you feel a bit like you were, I feel like I was a bit in the wrong to even put people on 
from the pedestal because I know that right. people have put me on a pedestal and so I know how it feels and I, it, it is really horrible knowing that someone's put you up there but you know someone put me up on a pedestal and yet I was painfully aware that I'm still I still don't know what I'm doing I'm completely winging it and at the end of the day I'm a human and I have made plenty of mistakes um so I really I'm uncomfortable with being put anywhere close to something like a pedestal you know don't please don't look up to me I'm not really an example you know, <laughs> it's, you know it's a really scary place to be um, yeah, it is. and people deal with that position differently as well you know some people deal with that and they love it they really thrive in it some people deal with that like me with massive imposter syndrome and, and some people you know, they can't handle it they 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 become a mess with it they almost it's almost too much for them to handle. Um, it does them no favours. It makes them become a, the worst version of themselves. So, you know, it's, I feel like we idolise, I, I idolise people and then you know, just, we just have a culture of it. Yeah, I agree with you. So it, it's, um, I have a, a final question for you and it's funny that we kind of end on this point because you're like no don't listen to don't like don't look up to me and I there's I I agree with that to a point. It's like yeah I agree with that to a point though it's like sometimes the culture of giving advice and the culture of like recommendations like there becomes this air of like, like guru whatever and then it takes oh, away yeah. it I feel like it disenfranchises everyone one it, it takes away from the person who is in the room who has a different opinion and who perhaps their opinion is even more viable and even more actionable and even more beneficial but because they weren't the one that was chosen to have that title they're totally disregarded and so well <laughs> I still I've got this question for you and um I'd love to hear your insight like if you were if you were to provide one piece of I'm going to use the word advice. Maybe it's not advice. Maybe it's a suggestion. Maybe it's a piece of encouragement. Um, whatever this is to you. But if you were to leave a message for the artist who is two steps behind you today, what would that be? I, I've written this in big letters in my notes here. Um, my advice to anyone who's two steps behind and wants, you know, is looking towards an end goal is take the time to give yourself permission to do what you want to do and to just be you not you it's you can look at other businesses and other henna artists and be inspired by them and think you know one day I want to be where they are I want to see what they're doing but really what you need to do is just give yourself permission to be as great as you are. I mean, there's a lot of motivational speakers out there who are saying, you know, you have the power within you and the only thing that's holding you back is you. And and as cheesy and as cliche as it sounds, it, it's really, it's actually really true. It's, I agree. You can, you can really, like, you're, you're capable. And I'm saying this to myself as well. You're capable of so much that you can't even imagine you just have to let yourself imagine and that's the hardest part and I feel like I'm only just like only just in my mind able to think I can probably do that if I wanted to I just have to do it I just have to not worry about not being the right person for it and I just have to do it like Last year, I even struggled saying, yeah, I'm quite good at henna. You know, people would say, are you, you know, um, are you quite good? And I'll go, well, you know, I do okay. And it's only now that if someone asks me, are you, are you good at henna? I say, oh, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I love I that. You yeah. Know? And, and, the, and that's what, that's what I couldn't do two years ago. And I feel like if that's where you're at, you really need to give yourself permission to acknowledge what you're good at and what you can do and that you can do even more than that you just have to open that part of your brain that's saying what if I do this wrong what if I do that wrong 
you know, it could be your internal voice, it could be your mother, it could be that critical relative, it could be a critical toxic best friend, you know, it could be any of these internal voices who's saying, yeah, but, you know, you know what you're like, or you know how you, you know what you're like, you know what you do, you do things like that, you know, it might be that person saying those things in your head, you just need to shut that person up and listen to yourself. Trust that you can do it and give yourself permission to be to, to have that trust in yourself, really. And I think that's what I really needed to understand like years ago, years and years and years ago. Um, that I that really doing all of this now is because I decided it was okay for me to do it. That it wasn't wrong I wasn't a bad mother I wasn't a bad wife I wasn't a bad daughter by doing it I wasn't a disappointment by doing it I'm I'm, I'm allowed to do it it makes me happy and it fits with what I was supposed to do oh man that's so powerful I I I know I that is that's so powerful. like you've left me speechless I think that's hard to do <laughs> but oh. uh, yeah I yeah, know but it is it's it's that's so powerful. And I think, I know, I don't think, I know that there are so many entrepreneurs out there who needed to hear those words exactly. So I have to thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for even wanting to talk to me and even having me on this platform. I'm just, I've been excited and nervous. Um, and just wondering what on earth can I say that, could be of any help to anyone um but then always coming back to my roots and realizing that just being honest um and as open as I can be is probably all you want it is it is it's that it's speaking your truth and 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 sharing your your perspective and your like I love that I love I've so enjoyed having I've so enjoyed hearing hearing your story and hearing your insights and yeah I, I, I have to think about that I know. I want to hug you now. Like I'm like I just want to hug you now. Yes. <laughs> oh my yes. gosh. So tell oh, me, tell me, like, um, where can everyone find? So if if they're not already following Connie and created by Connie, like, where can they find you online, on social, on uh, web? Where are you? Yep. So I'm on Instagram at created by Connie, and then I have a website which is the mm-hmm. YouTube createdbyconnie.co.uk um, I'm also on Facebook I have a business page um, also called Created by Connie but you can find my profile as well which is Connie to Tenor Artist um, I'm on all the social media but I don't interact with many of them um, very much anymore but they are all the same tag Created by Connie um, I think the best way to find me really is Instagram that's the one that I prefer to interact with uh, Facebook I tend to, I'm there, but it's mostly sort of, um, I do spread my feminist propaganda a lot on my Facebook, <laughs> so I have a very strong <laughs> feminist liberal agenda going on on my Facebook, so, like, if you're, if you're not down with that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't friend you, but, <laughs> but I'm open, I'm open to you. <laughs> that is so fun. Yeah, Best way, if you ever want have a question or something you want to ask me, then the best thing to do is to email me, which is bookings at createdbyconnie.co.uk, and I am much, much better on email than I am in any other medium. Yeah, so. God forbid anyone try to call you. Yeah, like, I mean, like, I will, I, will, call I will answer the call. <laughs> Just know that I have, like, deep internal struggles with it, and if you have a great phone call with me, I have overcome a lot <laughs> to manage to do it do it don't get me wrong I'm just not great at it <laughs> I love it I love it so much and, and let me ask you is there anything big that's on the horizon for created by County that you'd like to share is there anything that you're like do you have any projects or is there anything that, henna, that the Hennapreneur community can do to support you right now you know I'm, I'm in a typical um imposter artist uh, syndrome I'm not going to ask anything for my business or myself but for the community um I'm a moderator in a Facebook group called the Henna Hub and we're looking for moderators. And the moderator team has had a lot of slating for being, you know, possibly one dimensional. And now we're looking for more mods to join the team. And I'm aware that I'm possibly the only visible face of diversity in that group. And so I'm, I have pushed and pushed 
and we are now looking for more mods to join the team and I want what I personally want is more diversity in the mod team um, so that I no longer feel like the only person speaking the diverse opinion you know I want that you don't have to agree with me as a person I just want you to be okay with agitating a little you know having a slightly different view on things having had a different journey into henna you know you're not you know x number of millions of followers and you know that sort of thing i just want some different personalities in the team to work alongside me to really sort of represent what i feel the henna community is now okay i hear ya all right <laughs> well <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited to, to be able to share this, to, to share this with the Hannah Parker community. So I, I want to thank you for your time today. And thank you for your honesty and your <laughs> vulnerability. And um, I'm so looking forward. I'm so looking forward to seeing what what's next for, for Creative by Connie and for you, you know, just for you as a person. I've loved watching you over the years. And yeah, I'm so excited. I'm just excited for you. So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I yeah. Really special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have like you have my full support. Like you're amazing. So. Uh, oh. okay. oh, likewise. I just uh, oh, thank you. Just thank you. I just feel like thank you isn't big enough. But yeah, I've really I've really enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I feel like we're meeting in person even though it's all video calling and I do want to meet you in person whenever whenever that happens. I know it will happen. Just it will. Timing. Yeah, you know, logistics and things. But I just, I love what you're doing with this. And I'm really excited to see the finished product and everybody, everybody else's interview. It's going to be so much work for you, but it's going to be so worth it. It's going to so be worth. so fun. It's like, I'm so, I'm thrilled. I cannot wait for everyone to, to see the, the finished package and, and, and yeah. All right, love, but well, I will let you go. <laughs> Thank you again so, so much. And yeah, you have have the good, uh, a good rest of your day. Yeah, look after yourself. Take care. <laughs> Same to you, love. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye.